Okay, so I, I warned the sound guys that the sound was always set for really big men and they should be sure they might need to turn me up. And they did, right? <laughs> you can so hear me. Um, if you're sitting next to an empty seat, scoot in. We do that. People are coming in the back and they're all as tired as you are. They stayed out too late too. The people who are late especially probably deserve our sympathy. Let's, let's make a seat. Um, usually this is the part before I get going, I really, so let me just say a few things about us. Don't you love Ruby? Don't, don't you love having this conference? I, like I've been uh, away kind of for a year, I had some life things getting away, so I have not actually been to a conference in over a year. And there's something so wonderful, like you, you get off the plane, you get on the airport, and you look around, and you're like, those people are nerds. <laughs> like, you can tell, right? You can tell in the taxi cab line. Like, maybe we should get them in our cab. And then you get in the lobby, and it's like, ah. Like, I can have any kind of conversation I want with anybody without boring anybody. <laughs> Here, that is totally going to happen. And so I know that it costs money to come, but the money doesn't pay for it. You know that. It doesn't really pay for everything. And, and I, I feel like the sponsors have been sufficiently thanked. Um, you should probably go to all the booths and thank them. But, but there's one thing that I've heard said over and over again from this stage, which is, I don't know, maybe someone like Marty will model it for me. Will you stand up, Marty? Now, how many times have you been told that if you have a problem, that you should seek out someone in a blue shirt? And some of you may have done that, but I think there's another thing we need to do for all the people in the blue shirts. So I'm going to give you one assignment after you leave here. Before you leave today, go out in the hall and find someone in one of these shirts and shake their hand and thank them. It's a lot of work. And most of those people, you don't know their names. So ask them their name and shake their hand and tell them how much you appreciate all the work they've done to make this happen. All right, so there we go. I'm sorry. My keynotes always make me laugh. I'm going to be... <laughs> so I hate to be the one to bring this to your attention but I fear that you are unhappy. And I think that most of your unhappiness is an outgrowth of dealing with other people. <laughs> and I, I have two reasons for thinking this. One is that, you know, I wrote, I wrote code for probably a longer period of time than most of your lives, and now I travel and I teach, so I dip in and out of shops, like programming shops, 10 or 12 times a year. And so I see unhappiness on the ground all kinds of unhappiness in different places. So I see it, that's one reason I believe that you're unhappy, but, it's, but I also believe that you're unhappy because there's a study about it. <laughs> it came out this summer, uh, four people, some of whose names I cannot pronounce, so I won't even try. This is, uh, they describe it as being on the distribution and causes of programmer unhappiness. And so here's what they did, they harvested half a million email addresses from GitHub, and then they randomly selected 33,000 people. And of those, they sent out surveys, and they ended up getting uh, 1,300 some responses. They corresponded back and forth with those people, and they ended up identifying 219 specific kinds of ways to be unhappy. <laughs> All right? And so they took those 219 unhappiness codes, and they sent them back to this group of people and had them rank which ones caused them unhappiness, and they got back a total of 2,200 some references to codes. Now, of course, and that's like 10, 10 average, right? 10 votes per average for some kind of unhappiness. But of course, it turns out the distribution is not that even. Um, here are the top 10 causes of programmer unhappiness. Being stuck, I don't know. I find that kind of weird because I sort of think that's fun, but. What do I know? All right, time, bad code, underperforming colleagues. I thought that was super interesting. I wondered if their, call, their underperforming colleague got the survey, if they would say this. Like, is it a circular firing squad kind of thing? <laughs> Feelings of inadequacy, yeah, boring things, unexplained broken code. So it goes on and on. Um, so I found this list super interesting. And you notice they categorize some things as internal and some as external. I am not all that interested in the internal things. I'm gonna, I, I agree that they're important, but they're not about this talk. 
All right, so I'm going to get rid of them. And this, I, I just don't buy that feeling bored is external. So I'm, because I'm up here and I have this in my hand, I'm just going to get rid of that too. <laughs> <laughs> and so now we're left with these six, right? This accounts for 500. Like this is a large proportion of the reason that we report for being unhappy. And if you look at these six things, you can really decide, I believe that the root cause of all these things is other people. <laughs> That's what we're saying. Other people can be so annoying. <laughs> like you probably know how to fix all those things, right? You have an idea, but it's other people that keep making mistakes that causes pain, that causes pain to roll downhill to you. If only they would behave the way you want them to behave, <laughs> everything would be better. And so if despite your best efforts, you've been unable to get people to behave the way you want them to behave, this is obviously a problem of persuasion. And now is the time for me to confess that I have a degree in psychology. And this is something from which one never recovers. <laughs> <laughs> it has really shaped how I think about the world. And so when I see groups of humans who are unhappy, because they can't come to an agreement, I see it as a problem of persuasion. And this makes me sad. This shouldn't happen because it turns out that humans are absolutely hardwired to be persuadable. Like in the early days of human evolution, the world is scary and dark. And, when, and groups of humans that could uh, bind together and collaborate live to reproduce. This is how evolution works, right? We are products of the process that selected us for cooperation. And when people can't get along, there's, some, there's a fundamental systemic failure in our interactions. Um, there's lots and lots of research about this. There's lots of data about the ways in which we're persuadable. And I'm going to take you through a couple of different points of view about how persuasion works. Here's one perspective. This guy's named uh, Cialdini, I think. I'm not Italian. Robert Cialdini. He wrote this book, The Psychology of Persuasion. It has sold. 3 million copies. I have a book, and it will never sell 3 million copies. This is, a, this is a lot of books, right? So he goes through, in this book, he goes through a bunch of research about persuasion, and he ends up grouping kinds of persuasion into six categories. And so he, has a, he develops a framework to talk about persuasion. And I'm going to go through those categories, tell you what they are. Um, the first one, the first rule about persuasion is the rule of reciprocity. And here's what the rule says. It says that. I give you something or help you in any way, then you are, if I attempt to help you, if I attempt to do you a favor, you are obligated to take it and you are obligated to reciprocate. And you are obligated to reciprocate. I can ask you for something back e even before you volunteer it, and I can ask you for something back that is bigger than what I gave you. That's what the rule says. It's, it's interesting. This is a rule that saddles humans with a future obligation. And the evolutionary basis of this is I can give something away without losing it. I can give you food or shelter or space at my fire, knowing that it doesn't really actually go away from me. And so you can, you can really see how the, recipro the reciprocity rule would make it so that we, groups of humans could survive. Because it's so hardwired into us, it's extremely easy to exploit. Does anybody know who these guys are? Yeah, you're too young. It's really scary. They're Hare Krishnas, yeah. And so back in the 80s, notice what they have in those baskets. They're giving away flowers. And here's how they have a, I hesitate, I hesitate to use the word scam. They have a thing. They have a fundraising opportunity. And this is how it works. <laughs> they give you a flower, and then they ask you for a donation. And it really exploits the reciprocity rule, right? Nobody wants the flower. Like, you know, like in the 80s, all the airports in America were full of these people, and they would, you would like sneak around through the main like, lobby trying to avoid making eye contact with a Hare Krishna. Because they would give you that flower, and it was really hard to turn it down. And once you took it, it was really hard to refuse to give them a donation. The, the, it's, it's an uh, illustration of how powerful this rule is. People, so if you could not avoid being, having a flower forced on you, people would just throw them away around the next corner. And it turns out they actually, there would be someone on the Krishna team whose job was to go take the discarded flowers out of trash cans and bring them back for recycling. Like they totally understood that they were abusing this rule. And it really offended people, so much so that the reason you don't see this anymore is in uh, 1992, the Port Authority of New York City uh, brought a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court 
that banned soliciting like this in public spaces in America. We hated that. We don't want to be used in this way because this rule is important to us and we don't want to see it violated. Okay, that's rule number one. Rule number two is consistency. It turns out we have a strong built-in desire to continue to appear consistent to things, statements we've made earlier. Um, one way you see this exploited is that, you know that thing, parents here know it. You know that thing where in November, December, on Saturday mornings, this time of year, there are uh, ads on the Saturday morning cartoons for the cool new toy. And your child begs you for that toy and you promise that you'll bring it to them for Christmas. And then you find that it is unavailable in any store. Right? And so you, you eventually break down and you buy them something else. And then mysteriously, after the holidays, the ads reappear, and now, and now the toys are in the stores. And your child says, your child sees the ads, and they say, but I, can you get me the whatever it is? And you say, well, I got you Christmas. And they say, but you promised. <laughs> right? Toy makers do this on purpose because they're trying to spread their uh, sales cycle out for the whole year. And this is the way they can make you buy in December, and then they can make you buy again in January. It's deliberate, the fact that those toys are unavailable in December. I know it's kind of. This kind of makes me grumpy. Sorry, I should have switched slides. <laughs> All right, so the third rule is about social proof. Uh, we had a social proof example the other day when the fire alarm went off, right? Social proof says if I don't know what to do, in time, especially in times of uncertainty, I will do what others do. <laughs> like, I know the social proof rule. I was standing with a group of people in the hallway, and I'm like, let's go, right? It's hard to make that action. Um, I, I use this rule all the time. I'm a... I'm a cyclist, and it is common to be on a long ride and, uh, that is absent of facilities, shall we say. And then you're in the woods. That's what's happening, right? And it, it doesn't matter how rural the road is. As soon as you get off your bike and go off in the woods, cars start going by. <laughs> and, and if you have a, your friends, your set of colorfully dressed cyclists that are standing by the road, like all the cars go by and they look at those cyclists. And then um, we, it, there's a possibility that you offend sensibilities at this point, right? And so we have developed a, a scheme, a strategy, like I can absolutely control the gaze of passersby. And here's what you do. You just tell all your friends, when, car, when a car comes, to fixedly stare in the opposite direction. And you can watch it. Cars come up, all the heads in the cars turn to the cyclists, and then they all turn and look in the direction of their gaze. <laughs> Totally works, right? Social proof. So rule number four is about authority. There's two kinds of authority, really. There's this. There's a, uh, the kind of authority that's exhibited by people in uniforms, right? This is the obey me kind of authority, judges, cops, teachers. We, uh, they have a role in society, and we agree that we will uh, be persuaded by the things they say because of their role. There's also another kind of authority, which is called expert authority. We use that a lot here, right? Like, I learned TDD because some expert told me I ought to. And believe me, my initial experience was not good. I went from being a super, well, feeling as if I was a super competent programmer to being absolutely a accomplishing zero from one day to the next because of my attempts to do TDD. But I persevered because I thought that the expert was right. right? It's, it's a way to shortcut decision making about things that we don't know enough about. And that can uh, be super handy, but it can also go badly wrong you can imagine. Uh, the second to the last rule is about liking. We, if, uh, the, if people like you, they're more likely to do what you want. Now, I know that you're probably having a big duh feeling <laughs> right now, but, but think about that. Like, liking is so biologically hardwired into us that we never really examine what it's about. It's amazingly powerful, right? Why do we like people? What purpose does liking serve? We tend to like people who are similar to us, and we tend to like people who we've had positive interactions with in the past. Um, you know that feeling? So liking is linked, okay, so liking is linked to trust, and it's about trusting that they'll reciprocate. So there's this uh, binding of community that goes with liking. You know that um, this explains why it feels so creepy if someone is over friendly, right? Have you ever had that feeling? It's like, I didn't know we were this good of friends. 
<laughs> yeah? and there's, a, there's a feeling you, you're suspicious of people who are overly friendly for no reason because you, you understand implicitly that you're being bound in an obligation that you might not want to fulfill. And so liking is so hardwired into us that we rarely examine it. But it's, an, it's interesting to ask, why does liking exist? Like, what is the origin of this phenomena? And finally, the last uh, general category for Caldini is something called scarcity. We tend to value things more if we feel like there's few of them, right? This is why Amazon tells you there's, tells you there's only seven left, <laughs> right? It, the value of things go up when there are fewer of them. And, and this, this explains some really curious phenomena. You know, it is not your imagination that they go more slowly when you are waiting on that parking place. You're right. And the people who are leaving, like if you're waiting, if someone's backing out of a place and you park your car and wait, what happens is um, the, the space becomes more valuable because you also want it. And the drivers who are leaving that space report that they are hustling, that they are moving more quickly because you're waiting. But if you measure it, they are actually going more slowly. The only way you can make them go even slower still is to blow your horn. <laughs> that, because what it does is it signifies how valuable you find that space. The more value you place on it, and if they can see it, the more reluctant they are to let it go. That's the principle of scarcity. And so there you go. That's all of uh, Cialdini. These six properties, I, they feel... In many ways, they feel like triumphs of human nature to me. Like they feel like very positive things. And yet, Cialdini describes them in this book as weapons of influence. Now, I'm in a, a brief digression. I am really careful about how many keynote effects I use. Because <laughs> it feels like you could get bored with it. But did you notice how well Andy did yesterday morning? He used, every, he used that wall falling over thing. <laughs> A million times, and I never hated him for it. So I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna play that again. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> so this book truly is about weaponizing these things, and I, and I have to tell you, I hated it. It really offended me. I'm gonna read you two quotes from the first chapter. He's talking about these things as weapons of influence. Their strength is in the nearly mechanical process by which the power within these weapons can be activated and the consequent exploitability of this power by anyone who knows how to trigger them. That's great. Here's another quote. The great, their great advantage is not only that they work, but also that they are virtually undetectable. All right? Yeah, OK, we, don't, you, don't you love that? <laughs> so these things are hardwired, right? Stimulus leads to response. If you know, if you're aware of these rules, you can absolutely use them to your advantage. This book is about selling people things. And it's also true that if you don't understand these rules, you, sh you should probably not be allowed to go buy a car by yourself. Like, don't go in the car lot, right? Because they all know them. And so I, I really appreciate these qualities of humans. And I, and I hate the idea that we're going to uh, surreptitiously, in a non-transparent way, try to exploit them to manipulate other people. And so despite the fact that the research is uh, completely valid, I hate this point of view. So I'm looking for another one. And I found this from the days of black and white. Does anybody know who this is? It's Dale Carnegie, you bet. He wrote this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I'm just going to run you. It's, it, the book is in four sections. I had never read it. Like, we're all aware of it, right? Probably everybody in here has heard of it. I had never read it. It comes in four sections. Each section is, ends with a list of the principles covered in that section. So I'm just going to show you the sections and let the principles run and chat underneath it. All right, so the, the first section is um, how to make people like you. Notice that liking, like this, his book is opinion, right? It's personal experience, but notice how closely these map into the things that we just talked about with Seal Belly. This, the first one is about liking. Uh, there are six things in this category. This is what you have to do. I can promise you if you did those things to me, I would like you. That would totally work, right? All right, here's the next category. It's about handling people. It's got three things in it. OK, all right. And then now, this is the longest one. There's 12 things in this category. This is how to win people over. So this goes more directly to persuadability. <laughs> At some point about here, I started feeling inadequate. 
And it's like, oh no. Imagine the world if we all behaved like that. Throw down a challenge, is it's about that consistency, right? It turns out if you describe people, if you say, you're a civic-minded kind of person, perhaps you'll help me get out the vote. You, you hang that label on people, they'll live up to it. That's what that's about. So one last one, be a leader. There's nine things in this category. While you read these, I want you to think about what, what would work be like if your bosses did this? You have clearly seen this face, new haircut and all. And when I, I talked to Sarah about this talk, I, I told her I was reading uh, Carnegie and that I'd never read it. And she offered me a one-line synopsis, a plot synopsis, right? Cliff Notes of Carnegie. And this is what she said. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of truth in that. There's, there's actually, the, the Carnegie people would say one more thing about the point of view of all the things in his book. Think about every one of those things was not about the other person. It's about you. Like Carnegie's about changing the way you behave. His theory is that if you change your behavior, you can change the behavior of others. It's very definitely about you. And so this, make people like you, handle them respectively, win them over, and be a leader. So if you want, and if you want people to be persuaded to your point of view, you can do that by changing your own behavior. And, and I have to say that I like that a lot better than the other point of view, right? And so here we are, we have these things, we're unhappy, I'm sure you forgot that, but we are, and it's, it's because of other people, we hate that. And then we have these two sort of broad sort of frameworks uh, that we can use to persuade people. Um, you can use the, you can weaponize, you can weaponize influence like Cialdini tells you, and it would probably work, or you can use uh, the, the, the internally focused things of Carnegie, and that would probably work too, but at this point, there's a question we haven't asked yet, and it's now time to break it up, to bring it up. What if it is possible, all, everything that we've talked about so far is assuming that you're right. <laughs> that the best thing to do would be if they behave the way you want them to behave. Right? And now, I, I think we have to look really hard at that assumption. Right? How do you know that you're right? How do I know that um, you should be doing TDD? How can I prove that it is better if you make small objects? How can I say that my style guide is better than yours? Like, we don't have any facts. And I like to think that facts are facts still, even in the modern world, and that we are persuadable by facts, but we don't have them. Very much of what we do, what we think about writing software, boils down to opinion. And so, and the arguments I see, when I go out in the world, the arguments are about not ends. They're not about what we should try to achieve. They're about how to achieve it, right? And so we're having these big fights. Like, either one of two things is true. The people that you disagree with are evil, and their intent is to destroy your application. That's one thing, right? Or they have the same lofty goals as you, and they've chosen uh, different means. And so it, it's possible that we are more alike than we are different, but you would never know it. From my point of view, when I got on the world, you would never know it based on the viciousness of the disagreements. Now, I think that we do share common goals. I do not think the people that disagree with us are evil. And I, I, I think that not only because I believe in your good intentions, I do, but I also know what motivates you. And if you understood their motivations, you would be better equipped to forge agreements. So why is it that we do the things we do? And how can we motivate people to do work? And it turns out this is a problem that's tractable to research, too. In 2010, a guy named Daniel Pink published this book. He did a bunch of research at MIT. What he, what he did was he had people play puzzles and memorize word lists and shoot balls through hoops, all kinds of tasks. And he, was, and he incentivized performance with uh, money. 
right? So if you, did a, if you did a little bit of good, you'd get a little bit of money. If you did kind of a medium kind of good, you'd get a medium money. If you did really good, you'd get a lot of money. Kind of like work is supposed to work, <laughs> right? It was that thing. And, he, and here's what he found. As long as the task was purely mechanical, if you do this, then that happens, stuff, the money actually did work. Higher uh, amounts of money uh, created higher incentives, which gave, led to better performance. But as soon as the task became at all creative, when it, whenever there was any kind of cognitive component to the task, higher rewards led to worse performance. And, and this is not one of those uh, you know, modern sociological studies that has not been replicated. This has been replicated all over all kinds of different people. Like, this is a fact. It turns out for simple, straightforward, if you, know, if you do this, that happens, task, money, uh, incentives work great. But if you need conceptual creative thinking, that those kind of motivations don't work. Um, it's, it's not that money isn't a motivator. Money is. But you just have to pay people enough to get money off the table. Like as soon as you pay them enough so that money is not an issue, other things are mo far more important about motivation. So uh, Pink found three things. There are three things that operate to motivate us. The first one is a desire for autonomy. We want to control our own lives. The second one is a drive to mastery. We want to get better at things. And the third one is a desire for purpose. We want our lives to have meaning. For those of you who, aren't, who have never done this, you may not recognize that that young man is out on a, very early on a cold morning on the roof of a house that's being built by Habitat for Humanity in Dallas. He's building someone a house. Purpose. We want to do something. We want to work for something bigger than ourselves. We crave control of our lives. We yearn to get better at things. And we hunger for work that has meaning. These are the things that motivate us. And they, they perfectly explain open source software. This is why we do it. So if we can agree that these are the motivations we share with everybody, that all motivations are as honorable as our own, then conflicts between us must be due to differences about strategy, about how to reach our common lofty goals. If we desire the same ends but have simply chosen different means, the real insufficiency may be one of understanding. And maybe instead of persuading them to do things our way, we'd be better served if we got better at collaboration. We need to improve our ability not only to influence, but to be influenced. And that leads me to teamwork. Teams. Studies show groups innovate faster. They innovate more quickly. People are happier. They achieve better results. They report higher job satisfaction. But of course, teams involve people. <laughs> and people are the cause of much of our unhappiness. So, and, but it, I'm convinced that persuading all those people to do things our way is not the solution to this problem. So instead of asking, how can we be more persuasive, we should perhaps be asking, how can we make better teams? And Google asks this question. Back in 2012, Google has a lot of teams, and they have a lot of data, and they're good at it, and they really wanted to know. They wanted to be able to predict and make good teams. And so they embarked upon a thing they called Project Aristotle. They looked at um, everything. They looked at all their teams. They ranked their efficiency, and they measured everything, and they could not figure it out. They could find no pattern that would allow them to predict the outcome, the efficiency of a team based on the individual qualities of the team's members. They looked at personality. They knew things that did not matter, right? Personality types don't matter. Whether the people are all the same don't matter. Whether they socialize after work doesn't matter. They looked at everything nine ways from Sunday, and they could find no pattern in the data. And so while they were struggling with this problem, they started looking at, they, they came across the idea that a group could have an identity that was different than the identity of the individuals in the group. And, so, and that led them down a path to some research where people were, um, people were looking, uh, other research was, were looking at this idea. They had, they had, someone had come up with the notion that perhaps groups have an intelligence and IQ factor like individuals have. And then the IQ of the group is, is separate, different than the IQ of any individual in the group. That something happens in groups so that they form an identity. And when Google started looking at groups along this dimension, they eventually figured it out. They eventually isolated the quality that they could use to predict which team was going to be high performing. The fundamental thing that distinguishes good teams from dysfunctional ones is how teammates treat one another. That's all there is to it. 
there's two basic behaviors that uh, fold into this. One is um, the members of a team speak roughly in the same proportion. Of course, they were psychologists, so they called this <coughs> <laughs> equality and distribution of conversational turn taking. And this doesn't mean that in every meeting everybody speaks the same amount. It just means like over a course of the day. Um, I have a quote. As long as everyone got a chance to talk, the team did well. But if only one person or a small group spoke all the time, collective intelligence declined. So that's one predictor of whether teams are going to do well. The next one is a thing they call average social sensitivity, which, and all this means, this is another fancy psychological way of saying that uh, members of the team could infer how other teammates felt with uh, nonverbal cues. They could look at the expression on your face, or they could see your body language, and they would know what you were feeling. And so these two qualities, conversational turn-taking and average social sensitivity, are really part of, these are two traits that are part of a lot larger bundle, and psychologists call it psychological safety. This is a group culture where members have a shared belief that their team is safe for interpersonal risk-taking. It gives you a sense of confidence that the team won't embarrass or punish you for speaking up. It describes a climate where trust and respect uh, let people be comfortable being themselves. Now, it, this is not the only norm that's important, right? Psychological safety is not the only thing. Teams need like a culture of accountability and clear goals. They need other stuff like that. But this is the quality. Google's data indicates that psychological safety is the most critical element in making a successful team. This is what makes teams work. And making your team safe starts with you. You can set the tone of the next conversation that you have. Words matter. Words about the past are often about blame, and you should probably avoid them. Words about the future are about solutions. They're about corrective action. They're about what goes next. When you're faced with conflict, it's OK to have strong opinions, but they should be weakly held. You should have an identity, but keep it small. Don't bind yourself in the straitjacket of consistency with your past. If you think back on Carnegie's suggestions, they're all open-hearted and forward-looking, right? They're the kinds of things that would make psychological safety if only we could do them. And you have to wonder why we don't. What is it that prevents us from sincerely trying to make them like us, from winning them over, from being a leader? Why do we fail to trust their intentions, believe in their motivations, and make a safe place? Consider this. If you were in the middle of a heated argument, and one of your teammates uh, accused you of being purple, <laughs> you would probably say, well, tell me more about that. <laughs> right? You wouldn't have a strong reaction to that because you are not secretly afraid that you're purple. You are not your code. You are not your past. You are not your parents. And you are not responsible for everything. And I think if you pop the why can't we come to an agreement stack all the way to the bottom, when you look deep in the well, what you come to is fear. I know this because I'm afraid. And I think that you are too. But I also know something else, right? Fear is just the background noise of the human condition. We all have it. It doesn't really matter. We can't escape it, but it needn't define us. It doesn't matter because despite it, alongside it, and within it, you are also good enough. I feel the need to repeat that. I stand here and I see you, and I know that you are good enough. Hear me. Put that burden down. Your past does not need to dictate your future. I know that I will concede that some situations are so insane that they cannot be fixed, and I'm not urging you to stay in them, right? The height of sanity there is to leave. You get to go if it can't be fixed. But in situations where the problem is miscommunication rather than pathology, the most efficient way to change everyone's future is by taking a deep breath and changing yourself. If you want to achieve your purpose, learn these tools of persuasion and use the power of persuasion to make your team more psychologically safe. We are hardwired to work together. A good team is always better 
than any single individual. And to build the best team, you must reach inside and find a way to be your best self. Thank you. Stop. Stop that. I, I have stickers if you want. Stickers up there. <laughs> no, thank you.